Meet me at the Chazen. I'm your host, Jennifer Fields. Leonard Pongo is a Belgian Congolese visual artist. He calls his practice lens based. The exhibition is entitled Insistent Presence Contemporary African Art from the Chazen Collection and features five photographs from a series Pongo calls The Uncanny. For nearly 13 years, Pongo worked as a documentarian and photojournalist. According to Pongo, his profession taught him how to see. However, it was his family that changed his point of view. To me, the uncanny was this attempt to use photography and indeed in the beginning in a very, very documentary way because I started with a purely photojournalistic uh, goal, which was to kind of make a record, make a normal social political analysis of the country when it was going through its uh, second democratic elections in 2011. Uh, so I started with that and thought I would use the camera to, you know, kind of extract a kind of um, truth and a uh, zeitgeist about the country by photographing it. But um, the reality that very quickly caught up to me was that I was staying with family. I was constantly surrounded by family and also, um, you know, included by my family and uh, accompanied by them. And their comments on my approach uh, really made it change. So I very quickly um, kind of drifted away from that idea and realized that because of them mostly, you know, that um, Sure, there were um, plenty of, uh, of photographers photographing the DRC and in that way where they were conducting a study or analysis, creating truth. But um, nobody really cared about what it was like to live in Congo as a Congolese. And um, my family was really uh, vocal about the fact that there were already so many Western photographers doing the type of work that, that I set on to do with this idea of uh, working as a photojournalist. Maybe it would be interesting to do something else and to do something that also relates to them. And I think that what you're saying and what you're seeing in the images uh, has to do also with my position as somebody who eventually got more and more included, but also constantly had this inner and outer vision or uh, position living in an environment that felt um, quite familiar and that felt um, genuine, but also um, being at times uh, struck by how different it was than what I thought it would be, um, how overwhelming it could feel. And so that's where the title for the series comes from, this idea of being an alien and at times and at other times being just a part of a whole and this constant back and forth, which was very important for me. I wanted that to impact more on, on, a, on an audience than this idea that, you know, you're going to look at the images and you're going to uh, understand the inner truth and the complexity behind the life of every person in the images, which I believe by now is really not possible. But, um, uh, it, yeah, the, um, I think conducting this project and, well, mostly being with my family helped me to realize, okay, there's way too much truth to try and synthesize it into images. However, maybe if I use the images differently, I can um, provide kind of a bubble where you can relate to the experience. And um, I think that's what I really learned with this project and, and, and with the people who actually took me in, uh, which is to more try and get closer to experience with the images and uh, maybe not, not focus so much on the analytical part. It's, it's really interesting, Linda, that you talk about how this process brought you closer to this group. Because you think about documentaries as the other coming in and watching something and witnessing something and then, and then translating it through their own personal experiences, their eyes, their gaze, and then presenting it to someone else. And this idea that this thing 
this this lens, this tool, this camera became this this conduit for transformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Also f- for myself, huh? quite a lot yeah. actually. <laughs> Yeah. It, it was like it's 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 Congo and it's a um, intrinsically relational space, and so coming, of course, if you want to interact with people in this very in this more, um, what should I call it, utilitarian way of uh, I come, I have a mission, I will uh, create images of what uh, suits you know, which you usually do in in photojournalism. You have kind of a script to follow and try and document that you can do it and people will um question you of course and be vocal but they will also help you do that but the thing was um which i hadn't uh kind of in my mind coming really the thing was that um my family just considered me even though i'm a a european you know i grew up in europe so uh that's that's also part of of how they saw me but they just saw me as another child of the family, another brother, another um, another older brother, younger brother, depending on who I was with. And that actually made it clear that, sure, you can do the reporting if that's what you want, but you could also do something else that makes sense for the whole group. And since my point in being there was relating to people, um, Photography kind of became uh, embedded into that rather than commanding the creation of specific images, which meant that I had to lose agency, um, but losing agency in defining what I was looking at and how I was looking at it uh, meant that others would gain it. And that was also the whole point, which I completely agree with. That they know better, <laughs> yeah. better. Because in 2011, when I started the project, I had never been in Congo, so my only relationship was from outside, from uncles and 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 family and cousins and aunties that lived in Belgium and that I saw growing up. But with the country, the environment, the, the atmosphere, the um, I had no direct relationship with it. So to me, that was, that completely changed my relationship to photography and to myself. Um, but it's also, it kind of forced me to reconsider how I was going to use imagery and photography and what it actually meant. But it became also very influential on, on my, my way of, of creating. It's, it, it's funny how a thought, a process, could be so transformative. Like you, you you left Belgium as one person and you left Congo as someone else. I think I left Congo, like if I have to think about that one trip, which was the, so that my first time in Congo for, for three months, I didn't even leave it as someone else. I left it in a, a very question. I had, uh, how do you say it? A very unclear state of flux with many, many questions. Mm. And over the course of the the, the following years, uh, that kind of reconfigured also who I was. It felt a lot like parts of my identity also could express themselves or could make sense in the Congolese context. Uh, so it, it definitely, um, yeah, was a, a, a great experience in terms of, of growth. And many, many other, at many other levels as well. And it also helped me realize that, huh, interestingly, you know, the Uncanny has a very specific um, um, what, visual language. But um, I, I also realized that, oh, actually, I can lose agency in where I go and how. And, and that's actually empowering not trying to master that or to be in charge and control. And uh, that doesn't stop me from um, embedding also my kind of emotional response or emotional state into the imagery, which makes it then maybe um, relatable in a way that's less mental. But also, um, hopefully for me, it means that, that my position seeps through in a different way. It really reminds me of like the African storytelling 
where the hero has to go through some sort of body of water or, or experience something and then comes out on the other side transformed or mm-hmm. somehow changed or questioning who they are or somehow different than who they are. And they're so often dumbfounded about who they, what, who they actually even are at all anymore. <laughs> right? No. Right? Right? It's like the transformations happen, but they, they're aware that something happened. They can just never um, put words on what, which I think is a very powerful process. Even though it may be in the time uncomfortable and it should be uncomfortable, like that kind of change should be uncomfortable. I like the idea that it's that kind of thing that forces you to pay attention to it. Like you have you, mm-hmm. the only yeah. way you're going to get through it is to go through it. So you have to go through it to come out on the other end to see who you're going to be or to see who you truly are. And that's definitely my relationship with it because uh, the 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 way that my family would remind me is just, you know, you just get a slap, you get constant slaps in the face. I mean, verb- proverbial slaps. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's exactly what you're saying. It's like, oh, you, it's okay if you want to ignore it. You just keep on getting slapped. Right. <laughs> right. So it's oh. like whatever you if you want to keep on um uh being in control defining everything and ignore this process well the transformation is going to occur all the same it, it's just going to be uh, more painful if you try right. not to let it you can only fight it for so long and my father would say okay go ahead on with your bad self whenever i was like doing something <laughs> stupid he'd be okay go ahead you know go God. Yeah, do you. <laughs> do you. You go ahead. On. I can't tell you nothing. Go ahead on. Yeah. And you're going to learn. And there's really that that as well. You know, when I left, uh, I asked my, my dad, so my father is Congolese. And I asked him so many questions for so long. And he just basically let me go, you know. At the time, I was 21. And he was like, hey, you just go. Do it. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, but how, what? Ah, just go. Your, your uncle will be at the airport. And he wasn't. He had sent <laughs> someone <laughs> to pick me up whom I had no clue about. <laughs> so, and, you know, this whole thing is like, to me, it's a, 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 it's a whole process. And it's, uh, when you look back at it, it's very funny, actually. So then let's, what's your relationship with these images now? I mean, it's been what? So for some, it's been ten years. For some, it's been twelve years. What's your relationship with them now? What? How? Do, are you still changed when you look at them now, or is it, or has that sort of settled in you? I think I have more distance. Uh, I I see also um, how how I would have reacted at times when I took some images. Uh, some things still trigger me the same way. Others are just plain fun to look at. Um, sometimes I know so better who the people are in the images than when I took at them. Uh, other people passed, sadly enough. Um, so I was, I was, uh, when was that? I think two, three weeks ago, I was staying with, uh, I was visiting my uncle in Kinshasa and, um, uh, we were just, chilling and talking at his place and it was like ah oh, do you see you see these chickens well uh i like to think that they are um uh kind of kevin's descendants so mm. kevin is uh, uh one of my my cousins whom i traveled with and sadly enough he passed but he had brought those chickens and those chickens can't stop just uh you know spreading around the whole a uh, plot of land where where many of my family members uh, stay, and my uncle takes care of the chicken and he feeds them. And they they like they took him as a caretaker. Like they will come and sit next to him. They have zero fear towards oh. him. And it, it, it's like you know, I, I love that idea of things reconnecting and branching out and this continuation. So the images themselves. They're done, but that took a long time because um, the book is coming out now in uh, next week, actually. Ooh. And and I started the project twelve years ago, so it's a testament to how slow I work, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> which I, I I really enjoy because we did the the editing. You know, we started the editing from the beginning of uh, the COVID period until last year may and 
that was a long process. I went back to the whole set of images and I re-edited everything. I re-looked at everything, which was also uh, a very nice occasion to extract images from that archive and then just uh, spam my whole family with images of, you know, sometimes my cousins, but 10 years ago when they were absolute babies and making Whoa. fun of everybody. <laughs> so, so that was also a lot of fun. There's nothing. My family, we have a family Zoom every Saturday, and we oh, just, nice. there's nothing like roasting each other. Oh, everybody, no. Everybody's That's talking the at the same time, uh, talking about four different things at the same time. It's just nothing that replaces that. There's nothing. No, that, no, no. That, it's the best. Nothing. It's like you you know what you place in the family hierarchy is. You know who you can roast and how and how to annoy them best. That's, that's and you know they can't say anything. Only they can try, but it's going to be uh, to have no consequences. That that's I, the the absolute best. <laughs> and then you have to form alliances. And then uh, <laughs> at any moment that alliance could turn on you, and you're like, "Oh no, I'm in the hot seat." <laughs> this person has to be stopped. And you're like, right? "Yeah, we're going for it." Yeah, but come on, a PS5. What can you say? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you know that there's that part which is like it's very, uh, it, it's a lot less serious also, and and i like that because um the images can be in the project and i can be like very intense when i'm i'm focusing on something but then it recontextualizes to just have you know that one cousin that's going to remind you or how i don't know you you tripped and fell head first or whatever <laughs> stupid things you did <laughs> they're always somebody to remind you of who you are and yeah it's just so important because it's so easy to get lost in your own I idea of who you are. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You need people who really see you. You need people who really see you. Because that's the only way that you have those connections and you can grow from that. If I was always work, Jennifer, I would be insufferable. You know, yeah, mean, yeah. you need that little bit of, of a reminder of, of who you, what, your, what your DNA holds. And that you're not just that one thing that's either related to work or to that environment, but you do many things and it changes all the time. And that includes uh, being a, a, a stupid goofball sometimes, which is very nice. <laughs> so, Leonard, we have five pieces in our collection. Are those the, are, is that the entire Uncanny series or are there more? No, the Uncanny is much wider. So... And on top of that, it became wider in the process of making the book. So mm. I think the book is a hundred and something. And the uncanny, the, the, my edit of images was around 150. So by now, there's got to be, I would say around 200 images in the series. Woo. So Something then, do like you that. know? Are you familiar with the five? That, are you familiar with the five? I mean, I know you're familiar with them, but you know which five that we have? Because I want to get into describing them because we've been talking all around them, but, but I want to give people who are listening a chance to see what we're seeing when we look at them. I know I have them saved on the cloud. So here it is. There's one with a man in a white. I think you. I think you call them vests. So let me open the photos. Uh, I know of that one who's uh, Amos Nefas. Uh, he's uh, a friend that I met through another, through Sami, actually, Sami Baloji, who, who's a good friend who, who also uh, uh, supported me, helped me carry out this project. Um, so Amos was, uh, he was having, he was actually having a concert and it was like, uh, he didn't tell me, he just told me, yeah, come at this place at that time. Uh, let's, uh, let's make a few shots. I want you to, to do my portrait. And I was like, okay. And I got there and it was a whole concert because he, <laughs> he had, uh, an actual, uh, yeah, stage night, uh, in nice. Lubumbashi. So uh, I took some photos during the concert and it was after the concert was finished. It was like, okay, okay, come, 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 come. We're going to, uh, to the backstage and you know, you're going to do uh, something good over there. And uh, I started treating and then he started smoking and posing. And that's when this happens, which uh, we ran to the place where I was, uh, where I was staying. 
which uh, uh, which is the Picha Art Center in, in Lubumbashi. Um, and the next day we were just going scrolling through all the images with other artists looking over, and it was like, yeah, yeah, that one, that one, that one, that one. That one. So uh, that that's actually the story behind it. And then we met a few times again in uh, in Kinshasa because he moved there to study. And then again, uh, three, four years ago, um, at Picha again, so uh, in Lubumbashi again. Leonard, are all the series, the five that we have, are, is that one event or is it several, or is it different events? Oh, not at all. It's not one event. It's, uh, so these images were taken between, I think, in 2011 and 2013. And it's, um, being with family in one city in the south of the country. Uh, the, the, the church image is in Kinshasa. The, the two actually. Uh, the one with a young lady standing and a lot of blur is also in Kinshasa, but in another place with another pastor. Uh, Amos is in Lubumbashi. And the last image with a, a girl dancing surrounded by a crowd is also in Lubumbashi, but uh, weeks later at, uh, at a party. As so it was also the idea, you know, to have not this kind of, oh yeah, I'm going to tell a story about the country. And uh, it's going to be very organized and it goes through this, this and that, like with a classical um, kind of narrative device of this happens. And then we, it was more to have, um, what do you call it, um, uh, a shattered, fragmentary uh, experience with kind of many bits of mirror, many parts of the global experience that you could get into. And each part, each fragment is kind of one of these images. So it's not about saying, telling the the story of this person that goes through that. It's more about, okay, how can I match with imagery? How can I match um, an experience of living in the country by putting together kind of um, fragmentary excerpts from different experiences of being in the DRC? I love, too, the fact that in the West, we are often guilty of seeing images like this and assuming it's some sort of ritual, that it's mm-hmm. something that's sort of steeped in something deep and dark and mysterious that we could never understand. And But I love the fact that it's the, what would, could be what could be considered ordinary, everyday actions. Go to church. You yep. go to a French show, you hang out over here, you do that. So it's it's really the, this this way of of having of forcing us, or I'm going to say forcing because you can't make us do anything. It's an invitation for us to, con- to to step outside of what we think we know about the mm-hmm. continent. And that was really one of the um, kind of uh, leading forces behind the project after in the beginning i was really only surrounded by family and friends but then uh throughout the years i continued working and i even went along with tv teams tv channels that work in in actually also in 2013 that's when i started doing it uh so i would go with a, a team of like tv journalists tv reporters but only for local TVs, so they would only report on things that are absolutely unconsequential in the, for the West or for the rest of the world, maybe, or even outside of the region. But I was like, okay, how do I... I want to r- kind of recover or acquire or embed into as much experience of the country as I can and not having lived here, there's so much that I don't know, right? So right. I... I can't tell what happens when because I just don't know. There's too much I don't know. So how how do I get when things are happening so that I can see as much as I can, not just being also with my direct family and friends bubble, but I wanted to also be able to include things that impact people that I wouldn't get to because they're not in my circles. So going with these teams, TV teams, I would go to, yeah, 
one one body of water one lake would uh would have very bad water quality we would go report on that a market would open you know which yeah nobody would have a look at uh we would go look at that and create a um yeah they would go report basically and they would take me along and i could photograph it however i wanted um so that allowed me to see so much of what's happening in the cities which otherwise I would have never gone to because it's not something you see unless you pass by at the right moment. We would go and um, a new tax would be would be created by the, the the provincial government in Kinshasa. We would go see the the motorbike taxi drivers. You know, all things that are important for people but never get reported internationally. And for me, that was also a way of trying to. Um, get as much of these mundane uh, un, unimportant, so to say, events, or at least from the outside, because I had this belief or this hope that if you talk a lot about things that are um, not actually that big and that much of a crisis, it, will, it would allow me, hopefully, to relate and to tell a bigger story about everything that matters and about how people actually live yeah that was also very formative uh it, it really brought me to places where otherwise i wouldn't go i think the the lesson and i was talking to this with margaret about it yesterday is it's that centering yourself it's like when you stop centering yourself in the events and whatever's going on and you get a better picture of what's actually happening because one of our tenets in material culture is that you're not supposed to really interpret things to your own personal lens. So mm -hmm. once you stop centering yourself, everything opens up. You know, it's funny that you're voicing it out like this, because to me, this is still today in, in, in current projects uh, that's become a, a very important thing. You can actually, as an artist, create imagery that is very connected to the sort of images you want to create, the um, aesthetics that you like, but you don't have to do it based on only a certain set of specific values that you predetermine. You can also actually kind of follow the values of the place where you create the images. You can try and align rather than try and uh, put things in your context. And I feel that in the West and in Western thought, that's almost impossible. I mean, oh. you see, you see very good anthropologists do it, but in the, the history of uh, scientific thought, it's always chopping down things so that they match the model you have. And, you know, for me, creating imagery in, in Congo, it's also the history of photography in Congo is literally, um, the colonizer creating images so that they can identify, categorize, and control people. So it's also a context where you have to be extremely careful. But um, just like you said before, looking at the everyday, the boring everyday, it has kind of this, this power that then you have to talk to people and you have to uh, ask them what's going on. But also we're in Congo, people are vocal. They're going to ask you what you're going what you're doing there and what's going on with you being there and so you have this dialogue that's going on and that's sometimes more difficult sometimes very funny um but that means that you kind of for me the experience was more of being shoved around and going with that flow and then realizing wow so there's so much happening that i otherwise would completely miss and at the time, you know, in the past years, also working with um, within the, the more journalistic bubble, I met with editors, also European editors, where I would present my work, also for very big publications. And there were, one example really struck me because it showed me that sometimes the environment is just not the right one. Uh, the editor told me, wow, it's a very interesting work and... Uh, understand your, your point of wanting to um, photograph in, in the daily life and um, focus on things that actually happen to normal people that are not that exceptional or crisis related. 
But you know, when you on the highway, um, people drive, right? And they drive fast and they all go in the same direction. Uh, they, they drive forward. And you know, when people stop, people stop only to look if there's an accident on the road. Otherwise, they just keep on driving. <laughs> and that shocked me so much. <laughs> But um, I was like, okay, I didn't, I didn't say anything, but it helped me understand that um, maybe that wasn't the right environment for these types of images, but that it was so needed if even people who are on top of that industry still think like that. I think it was like five years ago, maybe. Um, then what I was doing was really, um, yeah, I had to continue working like that, which... Um, also felt a lot better to me. I would have no shame about showing my work to my family or to friends or to people who asked me what I was doing because I'm very comfortable with it. And when you talk about crisis and this constant, um, you know, angle lens of depicting a country or an area based on upon its worst crisis, for me, it was, it played, it was even nicer or not nicer, but more interesting because of course, documenting with TV, uh, I was sometimes in very rough environments or faced with very rough truth uh, events. But then it, it was okay to document them or to cre try and create an image from that because it wasn't, um, I never got there because of that idea of uh, documenting a script I had predetermined or that others had predetermined for me. And that, that, that meant oh, I can actually look at all the at the whole spectrum of life. And of course, it contains death, uh, crisis, and everything in between. But it also contains love and partying and, uh, you know, um, being stupid and uh, being... Uh, it contains faith and uh, it contains uh, taking care of each other and uh, being angry at each So. And, and instead of just trying to have this uh, one layered narrative, I could try and have a, a, a multi layer, a whole spectrum of emotions and to navigate into that, which to me feels a lot more like life. Well, you're seeing people as people and not a commodity. Yeah, they're my, you know, they're my family. <laughs> they're also seeing yeah. me <laughs> the yeah. same way as I'm seeing them, they're seeing me. So it's, uh, um, it, Everything goes both ways. You can be an asshole, but they can be an asshole too. And and you hope so because that's when it's fun. Yeah, they just it's just story building. I mean, it's just something for you to roast them with later on. Exactly, and 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 they will roast you too. And there's oh, there's yeah. many contexts where I was I photographed because I was angry, you know, and other contexts. Uh, uh, I photographed because uh, an uncle told me, oh, I'm going to show you something and you're going to photograph. But then what they didn't tell me is that they all coordinated to be there and to try and get me as drunk as possible that night. <laughs> <laughs> with with my dad's younger brother, who's then my uncle, um, but closer to his age, being there at 6 a.m. the next morning to wake <laughs> me up and make fun of me <laughs> while I was still puking. <laughs> Your family, they're like, that's, that's high, high, high roast. That's, that's <laughs> something I'm going to aspire to. They, they have a, a level of roasting that is uh, un unreachable. Still today, I don't think I, I'm, I'm, I would be able to get there. But, uh, and they do it seamlessly, you know. They barely need any communication to see what's happening and how it's going to unfold. Oh, my God. When, when I was a kid, I shared a room with one of my sisters. And in the middle of the night, she would, Jennifer, Jennifer, do you smell smoke? Do you smell smoke? And I would wake up, no, no. And she'd go, neither do I. And she'd go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving you out pumping full of adrenaline. <laughs> Just wound tight. Now, the, the, the five that we have are in black and white. Are all, is, is the entire series in black and white? Or did you choose black and white for a certain for a certain number of them, and why did you make the choice for black and white for these images? No, I went through a whole, through a whole process of uh, of um, uh, processing images. For me, it's also something important, this kind of craft and dance with the image and trying to see, you know, you've, you, you have the experience and you photograph and 
and then you come back to 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 looking at the images and wonder how to translate the yeah the record that you have into the kind of phrase words you want to say or whatever you want to articulate from the images so for me uh, yeah photography is really like more about the tool i can use to articulate a language that's not word based and that's not also um concept or id based it's based on imagery and i love the idea that imagery allows you to kind of transcend uh some preconceptions some mental reflexes and categories that we have and it can kind of embed yeah i see images i think as uh containers and here with the uncanny it's really i wanted to embed an uh, emotional response or experience and so i tried with color quite a lot and i really didn't like what was happening in many contexts it would make some elements very distracting or it would make it look more theatrical than it mm. was and i also came like from also personal aesthetical choices uh from a place where in photography i could relate a lot to this kind of um yeah japanese 70s uh uh you know very emotional uh emotional centered and very kind of biased and subjective uh, approach to to photography and also um the way of processing images in the dark room where you have this very physical relationship where you add matter you add light to some parts of the image and you can really um amplify one aspect and so that's how eventually i even pictures that i thought were beautiful in colors i always ended up processing everything in black and white and with time I also realized it kind of created that space a very experiential space where you were kind of removed from reality you mm. at least i felt that having that black and white series it was kind of a whole um trip you know where i could take people onto that trip not trip mm. I, i don't mean trip uh, uh a physical trip but really uh, uh, <laughs> uh like being on a trip on drugs or being on a, this idea of not just for the drugs but i mean this idea of being in this experience mm. and you know you i think the black and white it allowed me to um kind of force somebody who's looking at the images to be swallowed by this by this trip swallowed by that experiential space and inside of it and there's a lot you can't really recognize or identify or define and the that that really helped me to the 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 aesthetic really helped me to kind of create a universe that that's standing on its own and that's you see it and you see that there's something happening but in order to kind of um Exp well, interact with it you need to step inside and once you step inside you're like oh yeah i'm somewhere else okay new rules okay i have to go with that and i really like that it's like you can actually also as a as an author you can kind of you can't force the audience to look like you said but if you want to look it's going to be like this and there's a timeless quality to it One of my hobbies is that I sew and I've learned over the years that it's not necessarily the shape of the dress or the pant or the jacket that changes. It's the pattern. And mm -hmm. so when you're looking at these black and white images, this could have happened last week. It could be happening in two weeks. It could have happened 15 years ago. It could have happened 12 years ago. There's this timeless. I do. I get this feeling, this connection with it. That if I hopped on the plane and went there, I would either be catching the beginning of the event or just getting there as it's ending. But whatever yeah. I'm seeing in these images, it's still happening. Yeah, that party you're seeing on the image, whatever, uh, on the image five is still going on, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I love that. That's the work of, um, which was, I think, published by Revue Noir. 
uh, already a while ago, a work by Raymond de Parra, uh, black and white images of like the, the good life in Kinshasa in the 70s, 80s. And you see people beautifully dressed. Uh, it's also in black and white with the flash of tune at night, beautifully dressed, enjoying life. And of course, you see plenty of clues about the time because of the the models of cars that you see or the type of clothing. But um, it, 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 it is really true that he's creating it's kind of an archive that's timeless. And for me, that was part of creating a, a universe that uh, functions according to its own rules. I also wanted, you know, I told you in the beginning, I know I, I'm slow and how slow I am. And I really um, worked on this project thinking, I don't know when it's going to end or how, but I want to make it in a way that uh, it, it doesn't need to follow a specific trend or to answer a specific question that's very important now. No, it has to stand on its own. And it has to be um, difficult for people to identify or to play that kind of mental game of, yeah, I know that, I recognize this. Uh, I wanted it to stand outside of that. And also in terms of uh, discourse behind the project, it was very interesting now publishing in, you know, um, the so the publisher, Ghost Books, uh, ran a grant and I won the grant to publish the book, but I won it in the end of 2019. And so I was very um, critical of them. And I clearly, I, I went on a call and asked them, okay, well, are, you pub are you choosing to publish this work because of Black Lives Matter? Mm. Black Lives Matter, because uh, of course, it's a very good time for you as a publisher to publish something like this right now and to turn your interest on black people and black bodies. Yes, um, Leonard. Yes, yes, yes. Good, yeah. Uh, because I, I think uh, that there's something also very, you know, strange when people suddenly give interest to something only because they feel they have to. And to me, it feels non-genuine. And I was very happy to see that because it took so long to publish the book, I had more opportunities to get to know the team behind um, the, you know, the publisher and the, the, the designer and the whole team and to understand that they were actually into the timelessness of the work and completely detached to, from giving a, you know, a, politically involved uh, uh, answer to uh, an issue that became important. It, it, the issue didn't become important at all. It just came in the limelight. But it was always as important as it's been in the past couple of years. Um, so, so for me, that was also quite, quite nice, having time to think about the, the images and about the work to, to see that it could stand outside of these uh, kind of waves of moments. And hopefully that it's uh, something I'm still going to be proud about for the years to come, you know? Um, yeah. Well, it ties into the, the title of the exhibition, Insistent Presence, mm -hmm. on so many different levels. And, and, and that idea that I love so much that you challenge them on that because oftentimes when you're put in that position of there's something going on socially and now suddenly we're the flavor of the month where it becomes almost this, this expectation of the people who are requesting this of you that you should be somehow grateful. You should be yeah. grateful that we're giving yeah. you this opportunity. So I love the fact that you pushed back and were like, let's, you know, let's set the guidelines for this. Let's clarify what this is before I agree to anything because it's mm -hmm. so, once again, are, am I becoming a commodity? Am I just, you know, are you just paying attention to me now because you're going to make money off of this? Exactly. And uh, I mean, in this case, uh, I've been more humbled by the, the response because I'm ending up with a work that I've really carried all mostly on my shoulders, trying to, you know, find assignments that would get me to be in Congo or arranging residencies or saving my own money working for, for half a year so that I could have a, a few months there. But after 10 years of doing that, I have an editor that's basically paying for the whole process of making a book because he believes in the work where I have my book, my work published in, I think one of the best forms it could be easily spread. 
and at no cost, which is and with an involvement by the whole team, which was so much more than I thought than I had expected. So it's a very humbling uh, experience. But beyond that, the best is actually I had uh, uh, just a few advanced copies that they sent me that I could bring back uh, to one of my uncles when I was uh, this summer when I was in in, in Congo. And also to, uh, so 12 years ago, I had met somebody who became a, a chief um, uh, in in Southern Congo. And I went to meet him to ask him about traditions for, for my next project. And I actually brought the book because when I was there and seeing him uh, 12 years ago, we were talking about the project. Um, and and he he got exactly what, what the the project is about and what uh, we were saying before this idea of um being in a, a space of experience and kind of trying to get beyond just representation and uh using the body of commodity but trying to offer a possibility to relate to an experiential space and he like i, I went to see him one morning for to interview him and then i brought him the the book and he asked us to pass by in the evening for a drink at his home and he came back with the book and he was like dude that's really that's the way that's that's a great way to do it and i'm so proud of you for doing this this is really good and to me that meant so much you know to have okay i can i can try and do things in a way that feels faithful to me to my experiences and to my visions and my values and it will seep through also to somebody who's not necessarily related to the art world. And that, that was, I think, that and my, my uncle's um, appreciation for the book as well. That having that, that it can speak also outside of an art bubble is very important to me. You've been listening to Meet Me at the Chazen. Our guest, Leonard Pongo, is a photographer and creator of a series of photos entitled The Uncanny. Currently on view as part of Insistent Presence, Contemporary African Art from the Chazen Collection, an exhibition currently on display in the Roland Gallery at UW-Madison's Chazen Museum of Art. Pongo's book is entitled The Uncanny, published by Ghost Books. Meet Me at the Chazen is a production of the Chazen Museum of Art on the campus of UW-Madison in Madison, Wisconsin. For more information about the museum, its collections and exhibitions, visit chazen.wisc.edu. I'm your host, Jennifer Fields. Thank you for listening. Because that's the way you do it around here.